The views expressed in this video are my own opinion. I encourage everyone to pick up the book and form their own. What I like, others may not, and vice versa. If you would like to critique my own work, you can find it in a link in the description, as well as links to the book being reviewed and the author. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you're with me today. I finally got a moment to sit down and read, and not just listen to an audiobook. Today we're reviewing Infinite Money Glitch by James Crack. But first I'm going to promote my art contest. I'm running a pinup art contest. With social media so full of people drawing lovely women, entry is easy. Draw a pinup of any character you want. Tag me and include the hashtag BGPinup in the post on Twitter or Minds. The three winners will be commissioned for the promotional art for my new book coming out in February. The commission will be $200 each. I'm moving the deadline back to Christmas with the winners to be announced on the 30th. The remaining rules are the same, but I'll have a video explaining the changes out this weekend. For all other questions, follow the link to the video in the description. Back to the review. I've always been hesitant to read books about video games. I'll make those feelings known if I ever decide to reread Ready Player One and make a review of it. Most books of its like I find dull and bogged down with game mechanics, a problem I found with a few fantasy books I've read. That being said, does this book have the same problems? Well, no. I really enjoyed it. But before we get into what I liked, let's touch on the story. Wolf is an AI NPC merchant in a tutorial zone of a futuristic MMO. What type of MMO is it? What technology allows people to literally enter the game? We don't know. We're spared the technical details because our main character is an NPC with a strong hatred for players. This is only strengthened because we start the book with the ugliest character your average streamer could make trying to buy bombs from Wolf. Wolf is obviously hesitant to sell them to the man. The player being the average Spurg you'd find in a 2008 World of Warcraft common chat, throws a fit and starts attacking the door to Wolf's back room. Panicking, Wolf gives the man his bombs. The player thanks him by dropping one in the middle of the floor so he can use a glitch to propel himself backwards at Mark II through the front of the store. A store that is now thoroughly wrecked. We suddenly have a great appreciation for Wolf's hatred. There was a good reason Wolf wanted to keep the player from his back room. He has a scheme. Wolf has discovered a glitch in the system that allows him to pull common gems indefinitely from the iron ores that the players give him. The exploit isn't fast or very profitable, but it does get him enough drinking money to forget the players. If you played WoW back in the day, you understand. Wolf's friend Gary, his partner in crime, points out that Wolf has far more ore than he can appraise before the servers reset and he has to start over. With some cajoling, Wolf is convinced to sell the excess when they bring in today's Hall of Gems. After acquiring enough gems for a good night of drinking, they load up the cart and set off to Greenhorn, the starting city. On the way, they see all sorts of player degeneracy that I'm not going to mention here because YouTube will shut down my channel. Needless to say, it's Mardi Gras in Vegas rolled into one and sprinkled with an anime convention where the attendees are attractive and can't smell each other. They make it to the auction house and meet an auctioneer. A woman. A woman wolf spurned on a disastrous date. They sell their gems for a few silver, and a barrel of iron ore for a few thousand gold. Wait a minute. Something was wrong there. It turns out the price of iron ore has spiked to a few hundred times what it should be. Wolf realizing he has approximately 63 times the amount of ore he sold back at his shop dashes off to cash in. This starts off a series of familiar events, but this is where I'll leave off for the sake of spoilers and story. I'm going to cover my dislikes first because this will definitely be the smaller section. I really like this book, but there are still a few problems. First, there are a few sections where it was a little hard to know exactly who was talking and I got lost in the conversation. It only happened two or three times and it was brief, but it did stop me. In truth, I simply may have missed the character coming into the conversation or just being in the scene from the get-go. But it happened enough that I'm not sure I can blame myself for it. 
Next, there's a touch of romance in the book that felt a bit dull. Not completely out of place and not handled badly, but it felt flat. Fortunately, it was brief, but it was long enough to notice. It's also possible my recent bouts with romanticy have completely soured me on affection and I'm unfairly taking it out here. There are also some problems with the explanations of the economic stuff they're trying to pull off in the book. It's not impossible to understand, but it can take a while before you know exactly what's going on. It's not terribly explained, but some of it feels more surprising than it should. Lastly, this book can't entirely escape the problems inherent in a book about a video game. The explanation of mechanics. Most are handled deftly and don't hold you up too long, but sometimes the description of mechanics and areas feel a bit too grindy. These are all very small complaints, and you could easily be forgiven for not noticing them at all. I wanted to get them out of the way because I've got other things I wanted to talk about. My likes. Since I've started reading books, there are only two I will wholeheartedly recommend. The first is Eye of the Universe by Matt Waterhouse, a story taking place on an interplanetary cruise ship full of corpses. And now this one. But why? First of all, this book made me laugh. And I don't mean out of pity and desperation. There are genuinely funny moments in this book. Wolf is my favorite kind of protagonist. He's greedy, self-serving, dismissive, and opportunistic, but not in a cruel or evil way. He's a jerk, and is the source of all of his own problems. He also lacks the foresight that would keep him from the situations he puts himself in. His short-sightedness and lack of charisma put him in painful quandaries, and seem to do little but bring him more trouble. I love to expound on the horrible and funny things that happen to him, but comedy is so easy to spoil, and I don't want to do that. Wolf, I think, was the best choice for main character. Making an artificially intelligent NPC the main character fixes a lot of the problems most books about video games have. He's not a normal person trapped in a game. He was born there. This is his world. He doesn't feel overpowered because the system is geared to the players. This means Wolf doesn't have access to the trackers and chat that players have. He can't look up strategies online or use plugins. He doesn't even have access to a mini-map. If he dies, he has to wait out the resurrection timer and can't just log off to do something else. He can't join guilds, and players can just kill him for experience and loot if they choose. He does get a little overpowered later, but there's a decent scale to it. The NPC's lot in general feels relatable. The game is geared towards the players. We know and understand why. Without the players, there is no game. There's also the danger that any NPC can get deleted if they cross the developers. There are treaties in place to stop that, but we know those only matter if you're important. But the players treat the world like you'd expect. By trashing it. They leave mountains of garbage and guts everywhere, run about causing havoc and doing drugs, polluting and stinking up every place they go. Smells aren't a problem for the players because they can just turn off the smell function. Money isn't a problem for them because they can quest easily and join guilds. The NPCs don't have these luxuries. They end up having to rent small dingy apartments as they're the bottom of a tiered system. Getting a bit too real world in here. There's also the licensing they have to go through. Bureaucracy just makes my blood boil. Next, the book isn't about defeating some big boss or uncovering a conspiracy. It's about gaming the system as it is. Maybe I'm biased because I once got banned from a game for illegal auction house manipulation. Hey Blizzard, if racketeering in-game isn't in the terms of service, you can't ban me for it. Personal thoughts aside, Wolf is trying to break the system for profit. If you're into trading and finance, you'll probably understand what they were trying to do better than I did, or at least earlier. I wasn't entirely sure what Wolf and company were trying to do till about halfway in. The company also has a vested interest in stopping Wolf because they have a cash to endgame gold exchange, and what Wolf is doing may crash the endgame economy and take down the company. The characters are also handled fairly well. Each character feels unique and are not just played up for laughs. I say they're handled well as none are wasted. 
most characters given screen time, for lack of a better term, are well utilized. The actions of one have corresponding responses from others. None are comically evil, none are overly smart, and the plot armor, while there, is fairly thin. Sophia the Queen of Hell being a particular favorite of mine. This book does have a message, but it's handled better than most, and the book isn't preachy about it. The message isn't groundbreaking, and it's a bit trite, but it's a side note and doesn't overshadow the story. It's seen through Wolf's actions and the consequences of them. So let's get into my thoughts. We're going to have to ask the inevitable question that comes up whenever you talk about a book about a game. Would I play this game? In a lot of ways, I feel I've already played this game. It feels like an extremely advanced combination of World of Warcraft and EVE Online with a heavy dollop of gotcha game on top. It's a little hard to believe some of the mechanics were hid from players as long as they were, like Wolf's maxed out merchant skill that allows him to equip any item regardless of restrictions so long as his base stats match or surpass. This means he can equip in-game items despite not being the required level, race, class, or anything outside of basic stats. I feel like something so useful would have been discovered long ago. But yes, I would play this game. I love something with a lot of secrets and exploration. Also, I'd like to note this is probably one of the first books I've read of this kind where the main character doesn't immediately become a caster and start using magic, or find some magical exploit that breaks the game. Also, while I really like the story, the ending wasn't as good as I was hoping. I'm not going to spoil it, but it felt a little predictable. There are elements I like about it. It works, it feels practical, but with all the crazy stuff that happens in the rest of the book and Wolf's constant self-sabotage, I was hoping for something grander. This is again not saying it was a bad ending. It was satisfying. There's no cliffhangers or promises of a sequel. Everything felt in character, and it did the most important thing that all good stories do. It ended. Good luck, everyone. <laughs>